I would like to call the May 15th, 2012 Longmont City Council study session to order. Could we please start with the rose roll call, Don? Mayor Coombs? Here. Council Members Begley? Here. Finley? Here. Levison? Here. Samori? Here. Santos? Here. With? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, the first person on the list uh, is uh, Elise uh, Champy, followed by uh, Mecca Delego. You'll have three minutes, so please state your name and address before you begin speaking. Mayor Coombs, members of the City Council, my name is Elise Champ. I live at 828 Tenacity Drive in Longmont. Last week, I read my husband's speech, and I had to stop partway through mine, so I'm just going to start off where I left off. What I had said is that residential zones are protected in Longmont thanks to you, the City Council. The industry is pushing to drill in residential neighborhoods. That says it all. They are in it for the money. They are willing to take the chance that humans will get sick. This operation has gone under the radar until now. Longmont residents are unprepared. Give the people of Longmont time to educate each other and become a powerful force. We can channel our love for Longmont into educated action. We can help you fend off the oil and gas industry. Let's tap into our personal power, not the power that is under our feet. Right now, time is available to us. Time is where our power lies. The drillers do not have us over a peril unless we say they do. At the very least, say no to drilling in public places and no to open effluent pits. Even better, extend the moratorium as long as possible. That option is at your disposal. We all know what feels right and what feels wrong in this situation. Let's stand in our authority and simply say, not now. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Mecca Delgado, followed by Shelley Bassman. Hi. My name is Mika Delgado. I live at 142 Snowmass Place. I've grown up in Longmont almost my whole life. I've gone through the St. Rain Valley School District, and now I work for Boulder County. I also volunteer on several local nonprofit boards. I work, live, and play in the city of Longmont. I'm here today to speak about the work of the Longmont Multicultural Action Plan and Committee, LMAC. In the past, the committee has represented six different areas of focus, including education, housing, culture, community, health, and the economy. Many diverse community members are represented through LMAC participation, including cultural groups, local nonprofits, faith communities, other government agencies, the school district, neighborhoods, senior citizens, and youth. Some of my fellow members are here, are here this evening. <laughs> Um, I've, been, I've participated on LMAC for four years through many different opportunities, including task forces and cultural events. The value that LMAC brings to the city and the work of the city is a lens of multiculturalism and inclusion. LMAC and its task forces have been doing inclusiveness work on behalf of the city for over 10 years. We strive to make Longmont a place where everyone belongs, is valued, and respected. LMAC in the past has either sponsored or organized events, programs, classes, and activities that build a multicultural and inclusive capacity of our city and citizens. Events like Cinco de Mayo, Martin Luther King Day, Inclusive Communities, and the Chinese New Year. Programs like Parents Involved in Education, Catching Your Future College and Resource Fair, classes like English to Get a Job, and activities like Tamales and Talk and Dialogues. 
Today you'll be looking at data and work on the Focus on Longmont initiative. You'll see what the community has defined as areas of focus. As you do so, I'd like you to think about how community involvement can and has informed this work. Formal city departments and informal city groups like LMAC can support the work of Focus on Longmont. In the past, LMAC has been a flexible arm of the city that has helped move city initiatives forward. Now we look forward to addressing the priorities set forth on set forth and focus on Longmont, expanding into new experiences, cultures, and on a deeper level of inclusion. As you consider things like youth development, diverse leadership, and meaningful community involvement, think inside and outside the box in terms of how to get this work done and how to support it financially. It is not just the city government's role to impact these areas of work in our community. It is the role of the citizens, the nonprofits, the organizations, and the community at large. It is all of our work to make Longmont a place where everyone feels like they belong, has a leadership role, and something to give back. As you explore focus on Longmont and make budget decisions over the next couple of weeks, I challenge you to consider the role of LMAC and the community groups like it to support city departments. Thank you. Uh, Shelley Bassman, followed by Michael Belmont. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Shelley Bassman, and I live on the surface at um, 3414 Lakeview Circle, where we own the rights. Thank you very much for the moratorium, every single minute of it. Thank you for learning about and taking the time and the effort to learn about 21st century technologies for drilling and producing oil and gas. They are very different from the ones of just six years ago and certainly different from the ones of the last time Longmont upgraded our uh, oil and gas city oil and gas um, regulations. Thanks to, very much to the staff and to the council that we could explore um, what would have been the greenest possible pastures of home rule regarding oil and gas regulations, like no open pits or 1,500 set books. what people would, would have liked had it not all been preempted. We can hope someday that these operational conflicts, that, which the state now defines, will be relaxed or that a better balance will be found between what it thinks are operational conflicts and um, what cities know are best for its citizens' health and welfare. In the meantime, thank you very, very much for the research and the, the regulations that, that are on the table uh, past their first reading. Um, Joe and I were stunned to learn that the, the um, setbacks um, uh, stakeholder meeting the 350 feet that the COGCC has bears no relation to health and welfare, absolutely none. It was set in the early to mid-90s, and it was um, the parameter was fire safety and flash explosion, period. So the 350 feet is enough room for uh, responders and equipment to get in and put out the fires to save the product. And 350 feet is so the adjacent building won't ignite and they don't bear liability. And that was the sole purpose of 350 feet, fire, the fire hazard. So though the COGCC has um, a dual mandate to protect health, safety, and welfare, along with producing oil and gas, they have not um, performed. A talk is cheap. They, just, they say they've got this dual authority, but they have not um, acted in accordance with it. So it is up to the city to do so. And we so applaud the um, ban in residential areas that these industrial installations, oil and gas consolidated concentrated pads, do not belong where we live. And so I, I thank you for last week's vote. I urge you to all support it next week. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, Michael Belmont. Followed by Joe Bassman. Good evening, Mayor Coombs, Council Members. I'm 
Michael Belmont at 841 Tenacity Drive in Longmont. If our government insists on making this safe for this child before she can take it voluntarily, shouldn't they make sure that this is also safe before she must take it involuntarily? As you know, the COGCC is our government appointed regulatory commission for oil and gas. These words come from their own mission statement, and I quote, the efficient exploration and production of oil and gas resources in a manner consistent with the protection of public health, safety, and welfare, end quote. Thus far, they have done marvelously in the exploration and production department, but have completely ignored, neglected to show any proof that such operations in close proximity to schools, homes, and our open spaces are safe. According to my research, the COGCC has yet to voluntarily initiate a study on the health impacts. On the other hand, there is a rising body of independent studies that indicate the strong probability of negative health impacts, particularly surrounding air quality in populated areas like Longmont. Now, we have a choice to base our approach on one of two items. Number one, the many studies suggesting the health impacts, the negative health impacts, even though they may not have yet been peer reviewed, there no, hasn't been time, but likely will be. Or number two, the unproven statement from the COGCC and in the industry that this industrial operation is safe. That statement primarily being used in advertisements promoting the industry. This is not unlike if the FDA, which exists as a gatekeeper to protect us from the serious, potentially lethal impact of untested drugs, were to suddenly become a manufacturer and marketer of their own drugs. No small conflict of interest. Since the COGCC has clearly not fulfilled its duty to our health and welfare, it is our duty to hold them to their own standard. You have rightly perceived that our proposed oil and gas regs, insofar as they restrict these dangerous operations near our homes and schools, are our reasonable, logical way to step in to do what should be our state's government's duty, protecting our children and our citizens. So thank you for taking that duty seriously and holding firm to our oil and gas regulations as they now stand. After all, this little girl will no doubt someday ask us all, what did you do to make certain I had the best chance in life Thank you. for health and safety Thank at you, a Mike. time when I had no voice? Next up is Joe Bassman, followed by Elise Belmont. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. I'm Joe Bassman. I live at 3414 Lakeview Circle, where I own the surface rights. Uh, I'd like to pick up on a theme and reemphasize what's been said before me. When Shelley and I were at the COGCC stakeholders meeting, it, they were speaking about the 350-foot setbacks and how those setbacks protect our safety. The director of the COGCC was asked by safety, do you mean health? His answer was no. It doesn't regard toxicology. It only considers the ability of fire trucks to be able to drive around a fire area. Keep in mind, the setback requirements do not consider health whatsoever. A bit later in the meeting, there was a presentation by the oil and gas companies, and they spoke about how they go about the process of siting their wells, who's going to be next. And what they do is they come together in a room where there's a land guy, there's a geologist, uh, there's various other people, and they target basically where they're going to put their wells. Um, they were also asked from the audience, what do you do in terms of safety? Do you consider safety when you decide where to locate your well? And they say, well, of course. And the next question is, well, how do you do that? And their response is, we follow the rules of the COGCC. Now, perhaps you notice something strange here. The rules of the COGCC and their setbacks have nothing to do with health and welfare. There's something missing here. There truly is. So we all thank you. We all thank you. I thank you in particular 
for passing the prohibition in residential areas. And I don't want you to think that I've been attending for all of these weeks and not learning anything from you, so please indulge me. Um, I brought a sign. This is not the typical sign that I would hold up. The COGCC protects our health. So what I've learned to do with something like this is to fold it up and say, it's not worth the paper it's written on. So anyway, I urge you all, please, unanimously, next week, pass the oil and gas regulations that you currently have in place for prohibiting oil and gas in residential areas. And hopefully in the future, in this community and in all communities, that prohibition will be able to extend to parks, to cemeteries, to open space, perhaps to all urban areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Elise uh, Belmont. I'm Alice Belmont. I live at 841 Tenacity Drive here in Longmont, Colorado. Mayor Coombs, members of the City Council, I'm here this evening as a mother of two and as a working citizen and resident of this community. Thank you for showing your concern for the health of our children and citizens by not allowing oil and gas operations in residential areas of our wonderful city as part of our proposed oil and gas regulations. Thank you for standing strong as you prepare to pass those regulations to not allow, allow oil and gas operations in residential areas of our city in next Tuesday's council meeting. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience you'd like to address the council at this time? Okay, I will close the public invited to be heard. Hi there. Hi. I am Mike Schnotzmeyer, um, 12001 Twilight Street, Longmont. Thank you all for your support. Thank you for bringing the river quarter to the retreat for a second time and for hearing of the, from the invited speakers about the incredible untapped opportunities of the St. Rain. It is vital that we be clear that the underlying question being asked of you tonight is not about work plan items, but it is rather one of an ideology and of your belief about possibility and for what can be achieved in this city. The primary question is framed by the economic development staff itself in the retreat documents is this. Should the department focus on the first and main station or develop a master plan for the entire river corridor? Could we ask the question instead, is spending tens of millions of dollars in capital improvement projects and uh, without a master plan, the wisest and best use of these millions of dollars in public funds? Can a master plan serve to expedite rather than delay floodplain mitigation and public safety improvements by empowering a comprehensive range of development opportunities, new funding sources, and revenues? How can we as a city also capitalize on millions of dollars in such opportunities that other cities are currently and actively pursuing? Can engaging the ideas of our entire community in creating a river corridor master plan help serve to create rather than wait for new market opportunities for citywide growth? I suggest that we complete rather than delete the work plan items directed at the 2011 retreat 15 months ago and yet left unfinished. Those items include a citywide community engagement and discussion with both private stakeholders and the general public specific to the river corridor. It includes developing a river corridor land use zoning options, development codes, and incentive scenarios to encourage redevelopment along the entire river corridor. While it is important to recognize and be grateful for the dedication, hard work, and efforts of staff, it is also important to listen to the unspoken message arising from these still incomplete work plan items. This is a big undertaking, and the staff needs additional help. While staff has been working very hard on fracking on First and Main and other issues, they simply have not had the time or the internal resources 
to hold a single public meeting about the river in 15 months. They simply don't have a proven process of a community engagement for envisioning river quarters. They simply don't have river quarter specific experience, special expertise, tools, and processes required. They are not to be faulted that they don't have pro formas, charts, photographs, and examples. The message is clear. This is a unique effort and requires specially expertise to be done timely and effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I will close the public invited to be heard at this point. Um, Deputy City Clerk, could you introduce the first item? Mayor, the first item on the agenda tonight is an update on the water tap trades and emergency interconnect plans with adjacent water districts. Uh, Dale Rademacher, Director of Public Works and Natural Resources, and Larry Wino, the Engineering Administrator, will present. Mayor Combs and, and members of City Council, I'm Dale Rademacher, the Director of Public Works and Natural Resources. <clears throat> and as Don has told you tonight, we're going to talk with you uh, briefly about um, the issue of, uh, it's really regional cooperation with surrounding water districts um, with the City of Longmont, and specifically focusing on the issue of exchange of water services that are outside the city limits. And then secondly, to look at the issue of emergency interconnects between our systems. Before we do that, I would like to take just a minute of your time to try to uh, respond to some of the concerns that a member of the public brought up last week on a couple of your items that were on your consent agenda. Um, the first item that um, uh, some concerns were raised with <coughs> was regarding the Windy Gap Firming Project and a recommendation by staff that the council send a letter uh, to the governor, uh, thanking him for the support that they have provided and the leadership that they provided in the completion of the uh, wild, uh, wildlife mitigation and enhancement plan for the project. I will, I will agree with a member of the public uh, who spoke on that issue in one, uh, in one area, and that is, is that we should have uh, mentioned and made clear that the EPA does have concerns with this project. I believe I have advised the council on that uh, numerous times in the past. This is a large federal project. It is still in the permitting stage, and the EPA has expressed concerns. That was widely um, publicized in the Denver Post, and I also believe in the Times Call um, back in February. And so that is an ongoing issue, and essentially what you have happening is you have the state of Colorado standing up and saying, we have completed a wildlife mitigation plan, and trying to um, persuade the various federal agencies to review and accept that plan. Now, I, I do believe that additional permitting is going to continue on this project, and ultimately, ultimately, we have to have the EPA's approval. Uh, many of you might remember the Two Forks project from about 30 years ago that was vetoed by the EPA, really in the 11th hour, and we certainly, um, certainly don't want to have that happen again. So. I believe the project sponsors, which is the, the Bureau of Reclamation, along with the Northern District, are committed to working with the EPA on that issue. And um, so we stand by our, our recommendation that it is the right thing for the city as a participant in that project to support the governor in their actions. Um, this, the second item was related to the South Platte Water Related Activities Program, or SPRAP. And I don't know why we call it that. but. Um, what that is, is that is a, a long, going, uh, uh, long and ongoing effort involving the states of Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado, along with the Department of Interior, to develop an effective mitigation plan to address um, about four endangered species that occur on the, south, on the Platte River in uh, central Nebraska, near uh, Grand Island. And, and this plan was developed and came about uh, at least 10 years ago. Uh, Longmont up to now has not been a member of the South Platte um, um, mitigation plan, even though we were active in its original development 10 years ago. The reason we haven't been members up to now is that we haven't needed a federal permit for any of our projects. Well, that time is coming up, and the two projects that we identified, um, the um, uh, work that we need to do out in the, um, with the, uh, St. Vrain Integrated Reclamation Plan. That's a project that is out uh, in Weld County along the St. Vrain River where we are working uh, to develop and reestablish the uh, native environment and essentially a lot of wetlands. Whenever you do that, uh, that triggers a, a uh, Corps of Engineers 404 permit, which is a federal action. On the um, 
Union Reservoir Pump Back Project. That is a project that will deliver water and pump it upstream or to the west um, to deliver water to a variety of city parks and, and uh, golf courses and those kinds of things. With that project, it, it entails the extension of a pipeline out into the reservoir that involves filling and dredging. And again, that triggers a, a 404 permit. So again, we stand by our position that these are uh, federal actions that that uh, the mitigation of that has been accepted um, to be a participant in this in this endeavor. Um, it could eventually cost us up to five hundred thousand dollars to be part of that project. Uh, the, the cost for this year uh, in two thousand and twelve is about one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, which is included in your twenty twelve budget. We will uh, uh, intend to include in your twenty thirteen budget the next installment payment of about one hundred sixty five thousand. Once we get to this, those are essentially catch-up payments, if you will, for the other participants that have been in this endeavor for many years ahead of us. Ultimately, our payments will be about $30,000 a year. So I did want to take just a minute and two and just correct some of that. And if council has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. Otherwise, we'll move tonight's topic. Oh, okay. So tonight, um, I'm going to have Larry Wayno go through this uh, with you, but suffice it to say, the city and the two water districts around us, the Long's Peak Water District and the Left Hand Water District, have decades of a very good working relationship between, between us. And I believe that that is um, evidenced by the fact that we have an intergovernmental agreement that calls for this type of ongoing cooperation for the benefit of both the city and these utilities uh, and districts around us to have more efficient operations of their districts. So Larry will go through some of the details on this and this is all in anticipation of bringing to you, I believe on the May 22nd meeting, an action for you to take with regards to a couple of outside taps, outside water taps. Thanks. Good evening, uh, Mayor members of council. Uh, the purpose of the presentation tonight is, uh, first of all, to give you some background and history of how the city has been, has handled uh, tap trades in the past, some of the procedures, some of the issues. Uh, also to get confirmation from uh, council as to the direction that staff is moving as far as handling one of the issues uh, with tap trades, that would be with uh, the Longs Peak Water District. To begin with, uh, one of the reasons, well, first of all, the, way, the reason we have uh, TAPs uh, outside the city, uh, there are several of them, and over the years, uh, basically, once we constructed some of our earlier pipelines in order to get easements through certain properties, uh, that was one of the things that property owners really wanted to have, was a water tap. And so that... A lot of the taps that are outside of the city did occur during that process of uh, obtaining easements to get uh, our pipelines into the city. So first of all, that, that's one of the reasons there are taps outside the city. Uh, the second reason is uh, in order to make these tap trades, we're trying to consolidate our service into a, a very compact area. Uh, both the water districts, uh, Longs Peak and Left Town, are also trying to do the same to consolidate service. Uh, so it makes it much easier for operational issues. Uh, uh, some of the problems that we have right now with outside water taps is it does inhibit uh, the way and our flexibility of operating our water treatment plants and how we can operate them. And uh, in some cases, and in fact, this last year, we had to make some special arrangements to reconfigure the way we operate our system in order to make sure that the services, the water that was re uh, delivered to some of the outside taps uh, met uh, our uh, drinking water standards. So it does impact us uh, to a certain degree. Uh, from a historical process, as they all mentioned, uh, the IGA has, uh, we do have IGAs with both uh, the water districts. Primarily those IGAs address how the city and the districts uh, manage and handle adjustments in their boundaries, their service boundaries. Uh, it does also uh, talk, address how water rights are uh, 
handled and also how some of the costs uh, as far as when those boundary changes are made, who uh, is responsible for those costs. Uh, the TAP trade agreements, uh, and those are the issues that will be coming uh, to you in future meetings. Those TAP trade agreements are separate from the IGA. So uh, they are not governed by the IGA, but they, do, they are discussed in the IGA. Uh, finally, the annexation and exclusion, again, that's uh, addressing the boundary changes uh, between the water districts and the city of Longmont. So tonight, uh, what I wanted to talk to you about are, uh, first of all, the Longs Peak Water District. There are seven water service taps that we want to exchange with the district. <coughs> Uh, they would take over the uh, water service taps. And then uh, there is, finally, there will be one tap uh, with the left-hand water district. And that will actually be coming to you next week as part of the Collins annexation. Uh, we're making a tap trade with them so that uh, we will take over water service uh, for the property on uh, the Collins property. Uh, to begin with, here's a current map of the, or it's not a current map, but it's a, a general map of the boundary of the left-hand or Long Peak Water District. Generally, it's to the north of us and to the east of us. Uh, this map is actually identifies the seven properties uh, that are down in this area. There's three to the west of Birch Lake and four to the east of uh, Birch Lake. Uh, those are the taps that will be the subject of a future um, uh, request uh, or a trade with the uh, Longs Peak. Uh, in addition, this map shows a location for a emergency interconnect. That interconnect was a request made by Longs, or Longs Peak Water District. They have experienced two situations in which they did lose water, and they had to make arrangements to first, uh, in order to get uh, treated water to their customers, they had to start up a old uh, water treatment plant. Um, they've run into another problem is with a failure of a transmission line, which also uh, uh, had where they had a loss of water for a short period of time. And so they're very concerned as far as uh, having a alternate method of getting water delivered to their water district. Uh, so on the Longs Peak water tap trades, uh, the seven customers we have been working or trying to make uh, work with those uh, customers to um, sign an agreement to trade water with uh, Longs Peak. Uh, two, five of the seven customers have accepted uh, a trade to Longs Peak, but two customers have not. Uh, one of the customers uh, was concerned with the difference in the water rates between the city of Longmont and uh, Longs Peak. Uh, the second customer has not been responsive. Uh, we've been trying to work uh, this tap trade over a couple of years, and we have finally determined that we had to make a decision whether to move forward or not. Uh, we have checked with our um, uh, city attorney's office, and uh, it is something that uh, we can uh, notify the customers that we will be discontinuing service and transferring them over to Long's Peak. So legally, um, it is something we can move forward for, with. Uh, that is one of the things that we would like to get uh, confirmation from council, whether that is the direction we should pursue or whether a alternate direction uh, should be considered. <clears throat> the next uh, issue is uh, a tap trade on the Collins property. Uh, the Collins property was recently purchased. Uh, it is, uh, the plan is to annex that property. Uh, there is a uh, four and a half acre lot that will be uh, subdivided out of the Collins property and used as a residential lot. Uh, it is currently, that house is currently served by Left Hand Water District and uh, we would 
we're working to make a tra tap trade with left hand so that uh, water service to that property would be provided by the city. And uh, here is the location of that uh, Collins property south on a little bit west of Sandstone Ranch area. Uh, the blue lines, the heavy blue lines are, are the city of Longmont's existing water lines. <clears throat> and again, that's this is just a summary of uh, what I have mentioned about the Collins tap trade. Um, that <clears throat> the trade to provide water service will uh, satisfy the uh, city's water rights requirement so that uh, they are uh, will not have to uh, purchase or convey additional water rights to the city once it's annexed. Uh, the final thing I wanted to talk about is the emergency interconnect with Longs Peak. Uh, it, again, it was a request made by Longs Peak uh, because of the situations they have experienced in the past. Uh, all the costs, uh, that would be required to make that interconnect uh, would be borne by the Longs Peak Water District. It would be tapping into our existing transmission main, uh, constructing a pumping station so that they could deliver their water to a large or a storage tank that's uh, at a higher elevation. And uh, that again is something that we would like to get some direction from uh, council whether that is something that we should proceed with Dale. um mayor and, and members of council just one thing to add to that just to remind uh, or not to remind but to inform you that we already have an interconnect with the left hand water district and it's down on 287 south of the city. And I do wanna emphasize that these this is for an emergency purpose only. So this is not to supplement them uh, uh, you know, because they can't treat their water that day or, they, or, or, or they've grown too much and they can't provide service. It's really uh, for a declared emergency wherein this is really their only option to keep their customers in water. I also do want to say that, you know, this is the type of thing that the city is more of a um, provider than we are of a receiver. Uh, simply because of the size and magnitude of these districts. They're not, they're not really large enough to provide significant service to the city. Um, and so I want you to, uh, I want the council to also understand that. Um, I, I also believe that the, uh, the regional cooperation though is really the thing of interest because inevitably um, uh, the city and the districts uh, come together on any number of issues uh, surrounding water service and, and water delivery in St. Rain Valley. So. I think the ongoing working relationship is important and um, we would uh, encourage you to look at that and look at the terms and conditions of the emergency connect agreement when we bring that forward to you. And uh, with that, that's really the end of the presentation. Uh, if there's any questions, I can respond to them now. Councilmember Levison. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just wondering with the um, situation with the, the uh, um, customers that don't want to be switched over, um, have the neighbors who want to be switched over talked to their other neighbors to let them know that it's kind of a community effort, that a bunch of them are on board, and maybe there's a, a procedure that they can help the city out with, with a little bit of um, community spirit and, uh, uh, you know, helping, uh, yeah, not waterboarding, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, that's a little too dr drastic using that resource. Uh, so uh, I'm just wondering whether or not the um, there's been anybody out there to maybe the neighbors, uh, talking to their neighbors and seeing that they could all get along with, you know, having this resource shared as opposed to, uh, you know, us trying to persuade. We may not be the best party to persuade. If, if we already have people that are persuaded, this is a good thing. Ha, ha, do you know if that those conversations have happened at all? Well, we have, 
in the, the one case, the one customer that uh, we did initially make contact with, um, she was uh, interested, uh, but she was very concerned about the difference in the water rates between uh, Longmont and uh, Long's Peak. And if I could add on that, there, there are... Um there is a differential. Our, our rates are fairly low, even though outside the city customers pay 50% more than folks inside the city. Even with that differential, we're still lower than what Long's Peak charges. But there is no guarantee going forward with regards to our relative rate structure. So there was a time, frankly, 20 years ago where the district was cheaper than the city. The other thing I would add is that uh, on the city right now, they many of them need to have uh, uh, pumps. Uh, to boost the pressure because our system doesn't generate enough pressure as it gets to their home. So they do have the ongoing cost, and I don't know if that's been factored into the equation of this particular customer, but there's ongoing costs with regards to the, first of all, the purchase, the operation, the maintenance of a pump system that would go away because Long's Peak has sufficient pressure to serve them. Now, and, and really what we're looking at is the district is formed for the purpose of providing service outside of the city. The city uh, is, is formed uh, as a municipal water utility to provide service to the citizens of Longmont. And that's sort of been our overriding philosophy for, for many decades to try to work together to effectuate that change. So um, this is an ongoing process. It's not unusual for us to have a customer or two that, that hold out and wanna, not want to go. Um, and, and sometimes that, that, that does take uh, ultimately a decision and action of the city to, to move forward. Uh, it, it, it is important to also note that we're not leaving people high and dry. Uh, they will have water service from Long's Peak and it's, it's a high quality of water. Um, comes from the same source as the city's. Um, so I think all those things considered, um, it may not be ideal for all the customers outside the city, but when it comes to the overall operation of our, of our water utility, uh, I believe that's a more compelling argument for the city to try to focus on. And, and I understand that. I, I just want to know also, is there um, an issue with the, the um, customer that thought that the cost differential was too much? And I know from the packet that we've offered to, you know, backfill the difference for a year. Are they on a fixed income? Are they a senior and that they're really having a tough time out there? That, that I don't know. I, I do know that the, the, um, the one customer actually rents out the house that is being uh, served by our water. So she de actually doesn't live there. Uh, we've been able to make contact with her in the past, but it's been very difficult to make contact with her. We've tried several times and uh, uh, over the last few months, we have not been able to get in contact with her. So it's been a really difficult. Uh, uh, is that the customer that we've tried to contact by mail? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Are they out of state? Uh, no, I don't believe they're out of state, but they're, um, I, we don't know exactly where they are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes yeah. you send them a Starbucks gift card and say, could you give us a call and you'll get another Starbucks <laughs> gift card? <laughs> you know? Um, I, I just feel a little bit uncomfortable in that case where that person hasn't had the contact with the city. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I certainly understand that we do have to move on. So I would support um, maybe making one other effort to try to get people on board and then seeing if we can't get some agreement. Council Member Santos. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was going to suggest the same thing. When's the drop dead period? I mean, when do we need to have this done by? The, the, the tap trade with Long's Peak is not as imminent as the one uh, with left hand. And so, uh, you know, obviously, and, and staff agrees with everything we're hearing, that we will continue those efforts. And phone, knock on the door. Um, Maybe they're on Facebook. I don't know. I mean, we'll try everything we can to get a hold of them. And uh, certainly that's our intent. Well, I wouldn't let it go longer than six more months. I mean, if you've been trying and trying and trying, right. you know, it, it comes to a point where, yeah, you know, and Dale's right, we are a municipal, we serve the city in our municipal role outside of water district support outside the city. Um, and I'm fine with emergency um, connect. The only question I have, the interconnect, the so one question I have is, uh, Long Speak will cover all the costs, correct? But um, what type of monitor monitoring will will we have some m monitoring capability? Yes, 
Yes, it'll be metered. Uh, the agreement that we've drafted up uh, on the interconnect uh, addresses all those things, and we would have to be notified before uh, to determine that it is an actual emergency before we actually uh, activate the interconnect. Well, and we've always helped out our um, other cities around. I know we've we've been working with Lions for quite a bit on on some of their issues, so I have no problem supporting other districts and other municipalities when when they come for. Uh, uh, an emergency need. Okay. Councilmember Samari. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Now, you said we've been trying to work a deal with these people for about two years now? Yes. Uh, we started about two years ago. Okay. So, personally, I mean, if we've been trying for two years and five have accepted and two, one doesn't like the pricing and one hasn't responded, I don't see why we even need to wait any longer. We can maybe send them one final notice and say, if we don't hear from you by the end of this month, we're going to move forward. And uh, I have no issues with the IGAs with the other communities. Councilmember Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Um, uh, yeah, I'm with uh, Councilmember Samori, and I guess also with Mayor Pro Tem and Councilmember Levison. I'd send them one more notice and then move forward. That's where I stand. Good. I guess I agree with that, but I would say not only a mail notice, but physically go out to their doors and knock. Okay. And I know I'm also think it's great to be a neighbor and provide emergency water. I think everybody thinks that's a great thing to do. I don't know, is that something we need to vote on officially, or is this? No, I, I, I'm getting a pretty clear sense of council to move okay. forward on it, and we'll do that. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Mayor, the next item will be introduced by Jim Golden, Director of Finance and Support Services. Thank you. Mayor Coombs is a member of the council. I'm Jim Golden. Uh, and uh, tonight with me for this item are a couple other members uh, of the team that's working on this project. We have uh, Dee Weiser, our bond council, and Jim Manier, uh, the city's financial advisor. And then also tonight from the Harvest Junction Special District are um, uh, Jeff Konixini from the district itself and uh, Alex Brown, who is a financial uh, consultant for the district. So we pre-recorded a presentation for you already on the, um, uh, on the general area of special districts. And uh, since that was pre-recorded, what we thought we would do is give you an opportunity to, to ask us any questions. The reason why we um, did that in advance was so that you'd have an opportunity to look through that. This is uh, a uh, area that some of the council is familiar with since we've had the Harvest Junction Special District in place for a number of years. We also are moving towards potentially adding another metro district with the Twin Peaks Mall project. So uh, what we pre-recorded were was what the uh, laws are regarding special district formation and the procedures that are required and uh, gave you some generic information in that regard. So are there any questions on that information? Council Member Bagley. I, the only question I have is on staff, how, how many special districts do we currently have total in the city? And then how many do we anticipate into the future? I mean, are there, are there any on the horizon? Mayor Coombs, Member Council, so these are the only special districts, metro districts that we have in place currently, which is the only one is the Harvest Junction, and the, the one that's on the horizon would be potentially for Twin Peaks. So downtown is not a metro district? No, it's not. It's a, it's a downtown development authority. We okay. have a general improvement district down there as well, but uh, um, as far as a metro district goes, these are the only ones. You answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Then, um, Council Member Levison. Yeah, Jim, um, I just had a, a quick question. Um, when we uh, look at um, initializing the districts, why did um, Harvest Junction do 30 mills instead of 50, if that was going to give them more capacity to pay back the loans, the bonds? 
when you say, could you clarify what you mean by well, due? Well, it looks is, like is it, that why but, did they levy? Is that yeah? What you why mean? did they only levy up to thirty mills and Mayor, and not do the not do the maximum of fifty mills? Mayor Coombs, members of council, and in a few minutes, I'll have Alex Brown okay. come up and address some of those questions more specifically. But at that point in time, for the debt that was issued in in uh, two thousand and six. 30 mills is all that was necessary and potentially might all still be, be necessary to uh, to pay off uh, the existing debt service. So uh, they'll address that further in a few minutes. So do you know whether or not there are any special districts of this type that have gone bankrupt recently in, in Colorado? No, I don't, but I'll look at our consultants here. I'll D. Weiser answer that question. Thank you. For the record, D. Weiser with law firm of Sherman Howard, the city's bond council. Uh, Mayor, members of council, uh, it really uh, since the early 1990s, it hasn't been really very possible from a legal perspective for any district to file a bankruptcy petition. And that's because under our laws, uh, the district has to be in a position where it would take 100 mills of property tax or more to service their debt. And after the recession of the early 1990s, most of these transactions have been done in such a way that they are limited mill levy transactions like the, the Harvest Junction uh, transaction has been to date uh, so that they can never get to 100 mills. Uh, so the short answer is no bankruptcies since 1992 or so. Um, there are probably some districts that are not performing today in the way in which the investors and their, uh, their constituencies might have hoped when they started. But, but no bankruptcies. And, and are there any changes in bond rating for the districts? I mean, how does the bond rating um, issue get judged when you're looking at the, the strength of, for example, this is a, based on retail um, sales and, and uh, you know, how do you really judge, or I guess the bond dealers would judge on any kind of reissuance of debt? Really, uh, it'll be the, the rating agencies, it'll be a case by case basis, just like with municipalities and counties, and depends upon the strength of the particular district. For some of these districts, they have problems because they have a concentrated tax base with maybe a limited number of owners. Uh, and a lot of these districts are done without a rating at the outset, frankly, because of the startup nature. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions in general, then I'm going to uh, make some introductory comments regarding this uh, Harvest Junction Special District Service Plan Amendment that we have on the agenda tonight. Um, the district was created in 2005. Uh, at that time, it was uh, put in place so that it could pay for the public infrastructure improvements uh, for the uh, Harvest Junction uh, Shopping Center on Highway 119. Um, they issued debt in 2006, $8 million of bonds. It's being re repaid from their property tax revenues. Um, earlier this year, a couple of months ago, the district staff did approach city staff about uh, looking into the opportunity to uh, refinance their debt. They have a variable de debt issue currently, and they want to take advantage of uh, the current interest rates and go and change it to a fixed rate. And in addition to that, along with that, they are, uh, besides the refinancing, they want to pay $200,000 back to the developer that was originally upfronted for the district and also to fund a payment due to the city for half of the cost of a bridge over Left Hand Creek uh, that will go on, on Martin Street. That they are, um, it's a public improvement that they've been uh, committed to since the uh, project that was first uh, initiated. So, um, they did uh, approach us. We did talk to them and their financial advisor. Uh, they have uh, given us a um, draft of a um, service plan amendment. Uh, this is actually the second service plan amendment for the Harvest Junction District, and that is under review currently. Um, there are Within the service plan amendments, there are uh, a number of changes that are being proposed. The first is to impose an unlimited mill levy to secure the new bond issue. Current mill levy limit is 50 mills. Um, they also are asking for authority to increase their annual debt service payments. Uh, and those two actions both are what require a, a uh, service plan amendment to happen under our service, uh, our special district ordinance. And they also are updating descriptions and exhibits for the district boundaries 
and they are updating the financing plan to reflect this new plan of finance that's under consideration. So the district is also uh, asking to modify the current public improvements agreement that it has with the city regarding the bridge that I was talking about. And uh, um, that uh, will be uh, the, the public improvement agreement change will, will be scheduled uh, to be uh, in front of the council and on June 5th, which is going to be changed to be a regular meeting. And uh, for the purposes of, of both the public improvement agreement and also to have a public hearing to uh, look at the service plan amendment and act on that uh, for a potential resolution to approve that. The um, uh, options that you'll have in front of you that night for the uh, service plan amendment are to either approve it without condition, approve it conditionally, or else to disapprove the proposed amendment. So the rush for this is uh, so that the uh, district is able to um, move forward and take uh, advantage of the interest rates uh, while they're favorable. So with that, unless there are questions for me, I'm going to ask Alex Brown to come forward to get into a little bit more detail, and he has a presentation on the, uh, on the proposal. Mayor, members of council, my name is Alex Brown. I uh, have acted as the financial advisor to the Harvest Junction Metropolitan District since it was established in 2005 uh, by action, uh, by approval of the city council. Um, there's some redundancy in my material with what Jim has gone over, so I'll go through this very quickly and uh, skip over the issues we have in common and just focus on those uh, that um, he had not mentioned. So very quickly, the district was created in 2005. Many times these districts are created for both the purpose of building or constructing improvements and providing operating services. This is a capital improvement district only. There are no services being provided um, to property owners or residents within the district. All of the improvements that have been built so far have been built to city specifications and transferred to the city after an inspection and approval. And the one remaining major obligation is the Martin Street Bridge for which the district is is responsible for 50% of the cost of that bridge. The timing of that is subject to the city. Um, the district will not decide when that will be developed or constructed. That will be up to the city. Um, part of our plan of finance is to solidify the district's commitment to that project. This is a graph we wanted to show you that depicts the assessed value or the tax base of the district. Um, this is part of the reason we are before you asking for approval to change the debt plan and some of the security features. Uh, the assessed value growth in the district has been uh, fairly rapid. Uh, as you can see by this graph, um, a great deal of improvements were constructed early on. And uh, we're very pleased to note that even in 2012, the current fiscal year, when many jurisdictions saw their assessed value decline um, quite a bit, here the drop in assessed value was only very slight, uh, which I think speaks to the high values and strength of the tax base of the district. This this is the source of revenue um, the district relies on to fund its debt service and a very small operating budget, which is really uh, just for purposes of um, uh, periodic meetings, uh, preparing a budget, and that sort of thing. Um, the district does not uh, levy a sales tax, doesn't collect any sales tax revenue, um, but we included this graph based on some reports prepared annually uh, by your staff. We think this graph also speaks to the strength uh, the economic and financial strength of the district. You can see there's been steady and consistent growth in sales tax performance from within the boundaries of the district, including a slight increase in the year 2009 uh, when many jurisdictions actually experienced a decline in sales tax collections. Here, the district, uh, with the strength of its tenant base, was able to post a very slight gain, continues to show increase um, based on activity uh, at the center. The debt structure that has been in place 
was established in 2006. Eight million dollars was borrowed. Um, as Jim indicated, it was borrowed in a variable rate mode. That means that every week the interest rate is reset. Uh, as is common with this type of uh, transaction, there was a letter of credit uh, associated with the transaction that it provides assurance and security to the investors that all payments will be made uh, as scheduled. Um, because the district initially had no tax base and no financial resources of its own, the developer initially provided the credit support for the letter of credit. Um, we also entered into interest rate swaps uh, along the way. We've done about three so far to take the variable rate exposure away and replace it with fixed rate exposure. And that has served the district well, stabilized debt costs, uh, and worked um, well to provide certainty for short periods of time regarding the cost for debt service of the district. As the assessed value in the district has grown and increased, we have been able to release the guarantee uh, by the developer and the district now secures the letter of credit on its own. Um, and that speaks to the growth in the credit strength of the district as a borrower. Uh, we believe the district today is positioned to restructure its debt without any outside credit enhancement because of the growth in the tax base. Most importantly, one of the key benchmarks for borrowers in this category, special districts, is when your debt falls below 50% of your assessed value, you are deemed to have achieved a standing of credit uh, stability or security uh, that separates you from the earlier stage of this district's uh, experience when it had very low assessed value relative relative to the debt burden that it was carrying. So the district has matured, has reached a, a standing of credit security that is uh, recognized in the marketplace based on this ratio of debt to assessed value. Uh, there are two parts to the financing plan that we are proposing the city approve. Um, and the first is to convert the existing debt, which today is about $7.5 million, from uh, variable to fixed rate mode. And as Jim indicated, the district will add $200,000 in new debt to discharge a liability it has to the original developer for advances made for capital improvements. Uh, we're motivated to do this by the current low interest rate environment. The fact that a fixed rate bond issue will provide certainty and uh, known debt costs over a long period of years as opposed to the variable rate structure which is subject to change from time to time. Um, I do want to address the mill levy question. Um, the district uh, was authorized at the beginning to levy a tax of up to 50 mills. That 50 mill limit uh, is there, was there originally to protect the property owners and others from an excessive mill levy. Uh, as the district has grown, uh, that mill levy cap has become something of a moot issue. Um, today, the district is very capable of discharging its financial responsibilities at the historic tax rate of 30 mills uh, and believes it can continue to do so. So the ceiling is really no longer necessary by virtue of the strong growth and assessed value that the mathematically it's simply not the case that we would ever get to a 50 mil levy. And in many uh, cities around the state, uh, in service plans, there is often a natural uh, transition provided for in the body of the service plan that as the district grows in assessed value and reaches this ratio of two to one assessed value to debt, uh, the mill levy cap is released by operation of the service plan. The service plan was written differently, um, and that's why we are seeking a specific change in response to the improved circumstances of the district. Uh, there will be a slight extension of the debt term, about two years, uh, from 2036 to 2038. Uh, getting away from the variable rate structure actually involves less debt administrative costs and uh, management, so it's much easier, and as I mentioned, uh, the 200000 will discharge a reimbursement due to the developer. The second part of the plan is to provide uh, clarity and certainty 
uh, from the district to the city regarding funding of its obligation for the Martin Street Bridge. Uh, the district, there, there will continue to be a letter of credit posted to the district in the amount of the obligation due from the district to the city for its share of the bridge. However, what we're going to begin doing is building a cash balance over a period of seven years to give the city cash and offset the letter of credit requirement or obligation. Um, the city staff has requested that that money be deposited to an account controlled by the city. We had originally proposed that it be held by the district in a district account. Um, we're agreeable to making it a city account. So every year, beginning next year, there will be a schedule of deposits made. The cash will be in possession of the city. Um, the letter of credit uh, requires the district to meet a certain uh, deposit requirement over time, seven years as I've indicated. If three years from now the city says we're ready to build the bridge and there isn't the full amount in the account, you will draw on the letter of credit along with the cash on hand and the bridge uh, contribution will be funded. The district will then be liable to the letter of credit bank to discharge any amount drawn under the letter of credit. So we think this is an improvement for the city as we are going to begin giving you, the district is going to begin giving you cash in lieu of a letter of credit. And when that cash account reaches the full amount due, then the letter of credit uh, will be discharged or released and you will have been funded with cash for the district share of the project. Uh, Jim touched on these uh, as well, so I'll go through them quickly. Uh, the service plan does require us to seek approval anytime debt service payments are increased. Um, because we're going from uh, a variable to a fixed rate structure, that's happening somewhat naturally. Um, so it's not as though there's a, some sort of adverse event. It really runs with the type of bond is instrument that we're going to. We are asking for elimination of the uh, mill levy ceiling. I'm going to speak to that in more detail on the next page. Uh, but again, we feel the district has outgrown the need for that provision. Uh, we have proposed amendments to the public improvement agreement, which we'll ask the council to approve. Primarily, those amendments speak to the bridge funding issue that I just described. So it will help integrate that into the overall plan of finance. And then the technical plan amendments that we think are simply more of a housekeeping nature than anything else. But since we're changing our plan of finance, we will update that section along with legal description and maps um, to bring the service plan current to events as they are today. Um, we are asking for the mill levy cap to be removed, as I said, principally because of the growth of the district's tax base. The fact that this protection, which was once appropriate, is really no longer necessary. When the district goes to market its bonds to investors, um, a district in this position typically is allowed to offer an unlimited tax pledge in support of its debt obligations. Um, if we don't have that, then we're a notch or two less attractive in the marketplace and the district would pay a penalty in the form of higher interest rates, which we think would be anywhere from one half to one percent on the cost of the debt. Um, we don't feel that that uh, should be borne by the district in light of its strong assessed value growth, its ability to discharge the debt below 30 mils, and we would like to present the district bonds in their best possible light to investors as we seek to get the lowest possible rates in the marketplace today. Uh, point number two, uh, purely as a matter of math, the district can't really justify 50 mil tax rate. Um, it's not as though the district, and I think you know this from general government operations, can just go out and say, this year we're going to levy 60 mils, or this year we're going to levy 80 mils. Uh, the mill levy of this district is driven by the debt service it pays each and every year. That is far and away the major cost for the district. Once we convert to fixed rate debt, it's a known cost. We don't have to levy more than that which is required to meet the annual principal and interest payments. And our projections indicate we can continue with the 30 mil levy uh, that has been in place for a number of years. Thirdly, this is a commercial district. 
Um, and in a commercial district of this nature, the tenants who occupy the stores are concerned about what are the cumulative taxes because that passes down through them in their leases and becomes part of their cost of doing business. There is no benefit to the district and the board of the district to push the mill levy up at all because it is adverse to the goal of keeping the district fully leased uh, as a commercial property. So there's a, there's a mutual desire uh, both by the tenants, the, the other property owners in the district, uh, along with the district board to keep the tax rate low so that it remains an attractive place for businesses to locate uh, or expand. Finally, um, there's an element here for the city, perhaps, in that the district's obligation to fund this bridge account is secured by the same tax levy that is used to pay debt service on the bonds. So in a certain sense, what we're saying is release the mill levy cap um, so that we can be certain of fully funding the bridge obligation to the city consistent with the schedule set forth uh, in the agreements. So finally, and in conclusion, uh, we have a district here where the tax base has grown very aggressively in line with the projections originally submitted uh, to, the, to the city. Uh, we've reached a credit profile where the district should uh, be able to achieve good market acceptance as a credit on its own without any outside credit enhancement. I've spoken to why we feel the mill levy cap is no longer um, a needed protection for the district or anyone else today. Uh, the bridge plan, we think, is an improvement on the current arrangement as it will begin to move cash to the city in lieu of a letter of credit. Um, finally, the district has very minimal future capital needs. Um, there are about 15 to 17 acres of undeveloped land, but there really is not a requirement to, to build a new road or make any major extension or improvement. The bridge, again, is the sole remaining obligation. And as you can tell, we're seeking to discharge that liability uh, over seven years. With that, I'll conclude my presentation. Be happy to any, answer any questions. And if I didn't speak to the mill levy question adequately, I'll certainly provide more information as I can. Councilmember Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Um, quick question. Um, if you go back to that graph, the one with the assessed value, can you define what is assessed value? How is that determined? The um, assessed value graph begins with the assessor, the county assessor, establishing a market value for all of the land and improvements within the district. Um, because these are commercial, uh, the assessor is looking to other similar retail properties and determining what the value is. They can also consider the um, uh, income generating capacity of the property and arriving at the market value for each and every building and piece of ground in the district. As a commercial property then, that market value is adjusted by a ratio of 29% to create the assessed value, and that is the number on which the mill levy is then imposed uh, for payment of taxes. Okay, great. And then uh, the other question is, if they were to increase the mill levy, is that a unilateral decision on their part, or is City Council, the, do they have to come back to City Council? It would be an action of the Board of Directors uh, of the Special District. Okay, I guess the disconnect for me then is, I, I understand both of your explanations. I understand if you need to go buy a bond, I mean, I understand the risk factor. And I also understand that mathematically it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to screw over your tenants. But what I don't understand is, uh, on one, I mean, why would the market care? I, I mean, I, I understand your, the disconnect is, all right, if mathematically we can't do it anyway, right. And at the same time, you're asking us to remove the ceiling. It just seems like if it's of no consequence, why do it at all? Well, the answer is because the market is always looking for a reason to penalize you and charge you a higher interest rate. And, and as you begin to present yourself as different from this other district that I bought a month ago and that this other district had an unlimited tax pledge, yours is limited, bang, I'm going to ding you and I'm going to charge you more. So the market penalizes you for being different. We're trying to be similar to districts with an equal credit standard. Okay, so it's not so it's in the event that it's needed, we don't think it is, right. they want the assurance that we're going to step up, increase right. taxes, and pay back their debt. That's it. That's right. On a scale from one, 0 to 100, what are the odds that the mill levy would be increased beyond 50 mills? 
one, okay. because I don't believe in absolutes. So one. All right, one. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair answer. Thank you. <laughs> Council Member Levison. Thank you. Um, I, I don't mean to be mean, but um, we haven't had really good, timely audited reports submitted from this district. And, you know, we got a, a report that had a um, an outside audit date of July 28, 2011. And, you know, it just showed up on the city's doors, doorstep a few weeks ago. And I know that you should have been, I mean, there's really no justification, in my opinion, to have something that was a calendar year end of 2010, and here it is, the first quarter of, of 2012, and we we finally get the audit report. And I noticed it's the first time I, I reviewed the uh, an audit report from this district. Um, so I, I'm not really, um, you know, I, I sort of need to know the reason why that happens, and maybe it's because we weren't knocking on your door asking for it in a timely fashion. But um, the other thing I'm aware of, that, that special district um, law in Colorado would allow you to take um, some of the uh, proceeds of um, any additional, any mills to do things like um, invest in, um, uh, you know, Greek debt or European um, uh, debt. You can also pay back initial investors. So um, you can do some other things that are not as straightforward as what you're presenting with us and so to us. And so that's why I have a discomfort about the unlimited mill. Because not knowing who's going to be the owners of this property in the future and how they'll leverage it, um, I think that the assessed, uh, we know that this is a, a great piece of, of real estate as far as the um, the potential that it's shown as far as sales tax receipts and the assessed value. But the other thing I would like to point out, just the um, the assessed values continue to go up um, and noting that there are um, new tenants constantly being added to the district. So I think that, um, you know, there is some increase in value, but some of it is actually due to the fact that the uh, facility not the facility, but the uh, there are continuing to be value-added pieces of building going on in this property. And I still see that there are many pad sites that could be built out again so that there could be even an increasing amount of uh, assessed value on this. Um, uh, and the assessed value of Harvard Junction has sort of gone in um, – the uh, uh, direct opposite as the uh, the Twin Peaks Mall. So the success of Harvest Junction, in some some respects, has been, you know, the the two two sides of the graph. You know, this goes up and the other one goes down. And for a while, they were owned by this the same um, owners. Uh, you know, I, I hate to say this, but um, you know, to me, the the unlimited. Um, uh, mill levy, it, you've, you've demonstrated to us that you don't need more than 30 mills. Um, 50 mills is more than adequate. And um, frankly, um, cities deal with this um, issue all the time with uh, how much tax can be devoted to debt service. Um, my suggestion is those two guys right there have done us really well over the years. Um, and I, I'm thinking that um, I, you know, I, I'm not comfortable with everything that happens in the financial markets. Um, I'm not comfortable with an unlimited um, debt, just because, frankly, um, we don't have many controls over the district either. You come to us for something like this, but the city is not um, on the board of directors, nor can we be, because we don't own property of the district. And we don't get your audited reports until 15 months after the calendar year closes. And um, I just think that uh, this is our, our last little vestige of uh, some control over um, basically a municipal form of government within our own, on, on our own boundaries. And especially since it's the um, shopping retail district that we depend so heavily on to generate income right now. So I understand all the dynamics you're talking about, but... Um, you know, with with what happened with J.P. Morgan Chase this this week, it seems like we still have structural problems within the uh, the uh, financial markets. And um, this would be my only um, uh, piece of control to say that that we could have 
um, some measure of surety that we don't go off the scale with this particular property. And I, you know, I've read the special district law many, many times. There's a lot of flexibility in that law for monkey business. And it hasn't happened, but there's that potential. The um, failure of the district to submit its audit in a timely fashion um, was more than an, an oversight. It was poor performance. Um, it has been duly noted by the district. Uh, we do, the district does contract with an accounting firm uh, that manages the books and uh, contracts for the audit. Um, they have been made aware that the, the city has to be on the distribution list from the get-go for this kind of thing. It was one of the first things that Jim brought to our attention, so we are aware of that poor performance, as I said, and I don't think the district has any intention of repeating it or ignoring the requirements it is subject to in terms of reporting going forward in the future. Um, I believe the district is subject to uh, general state statutes governing public investments or investments of public funds, um, and uh, we can certainly discuss with your staff the adoption of an investment policy uh, by the board to very narrowly restrict uh, the types of instruments that are authorized for investment. Um, this district does not have uh, a large cash portfolio um, that is invested you know, here or there for any lengthy period of time, but I think it's certainly appropriate to discuss an investment policy, and I am sure that we will quickly reach agreement on a very narrow uh, list of safest milk type investments, because that's really all the district wants to do. Um, Yes, we, we can. The district can discharge its obligations going forward um, uh, with or below a 50 mil level, um, but I would uh, point out to you that if that mill levy continues, um, you're, you're really, in, in a certain sense, harming the property owners in the district because they're going to pay a higher cost for their debt. And, and I just think we're at a point now where the district has reached uh, a, a stage of credit development where uh, it, it's very clear what the levy is going to be. There's no justification for the board to go wild. Um, a special district does operate under the constraints of the service plan as approved by the city, so it's not an entirely independent government, um, certainly not the way a home rule city is. Um, so it, it's certainly subject to some constraints going forward uh, by virtue of the requirements in the service plan. But basically we feel it's an appropriate re request at this time and it is in the best interest of the district achieving the best possible borrowing in the marketplace. Councilmember Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Do any, anybody else want to say anything? I just have one, another quick question. So of every dollar that you guys collect, for, uh, the property collects off its mill, of that dollar, what percentage of it goes to pay back debt versus new expenses? Um, it's probably 90%. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a, this, as I said at the outset, this district was formed for the purpose of financing capital improvements. So. Right, so, I mean, so in a nutshell, I mean, the only reason why you'd increase the mill is if you can't meet your debt obligations, in which case the property would be in trouble already. So all we're doing is allowing them the ability to increase their ability to pay the debt. We, we, don't, such. Right. we, we don't know what assessed value law and statutes are going to be over the full term of the debt. Um, this way it eliminates any concern for the investor that will hit that cap for reasons of changes in state law. Well, I'm going to weigh in here. Um, to me it seems like it's a win-win to remove the uh, mill levy just because it gives you better interest rates. And then your tenants and everybody wins. It, I don't see a huge downside to it. Now, we, you know, if we get really concerned, we can put, like you said, limits on what you can invest in with your extra cash. It doesn't look like you're, you have a whole lot of extra cash. You're just paying down debt with it anyway. Uh, so maybe I'll ask uh, our uh, Jim Golden, our Finance guy, uh, do you see a downside? I mean, to me, it just seems like it's a win-win for everybody, and I'm, unless I'm really missing something. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, I think Alex has explained all the, the aspects of it very well. And, um, um, you know, I, there may be s small risk that, that that mill levy may be increased because of what happens to assess valuations in the future, but uh, I think it's probably a very minimal risk, and, and it's going to be taxing the owners, which is themselves. So, yeah. okay. 
Councilmember Larson. Well, I, you know, something that is really disturbing for me is that, you know, this district was begun, and I understand that you had variable interest rates, but interest rates have been going down, down, down ever since, you know, I know it probably was much higher when the debt was, um, uh, the bonds were, were sent out in, in 06. But if you look at, you started with $8 million worth of debt, and your current principal amount is 700 uh, I mean, seven million five hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars. You know, in six years, you've paid down, um, you know, less than um, half a million dollars worth of debt. That doesn't seem like great, great performance as far as. Um, uh, but I, you know, I guess it depends on on the term. But it seems like you might have burned through a lot of resources already with the cost of you know, the original, the way it was, the financials were originally structured. I seem to have the correct uh, graph on the uh, screen to respond to that question. Um, the answer is basically that we didn't have, the district did not have any assessed value the first year it borrowed money. It has only, uh, only recently grown its assessed value to a level where larger principal payments can be accommodated. In the early years, um, we were using the tax proceeds to pay the interest because that's what the tax base supported. Now that the district has grown to a higher level uh, of assessed value, we can begin paying down uh, principal and the first principal, quite frankly, we're going to pay is the bridge obligation to the city. So we'll be picking up those payments. Um, but the answer to your question is when you begin with a low assessed value, you simply don't have the resources to make large principal payments. You're directing what you have at paying interest. And I know that part of the, what was done originally was the infrastructure to remove a lot of this property out of the 100-year floodplain. So the minute you do that, you know, that, that improvement already brings up your assessed value because you're not paying flood insurance any longer and that sort of thing. Um, I, I guess the one sticking point that, that is really bothering me is that, um, as you said, you know, this is in the best interest of the district. I want to make sure that we do what's in the best interest of the city. So if you don't mind, um, I'd like to get some some response to the, the conundrum about, you know, God, it's, it seems like a dangerous thing for a city to say, give a quasi-municipal form of government basically a blank check, saying, yes, please, <laughs> come to the podium, Mr. Meniers. I mean, I just, as a, a matter of public policy, it makes me really, really nervous. You know, personally, we don't do variable interest rates and interest-only loans in my family, and I just want to make sure that you know, an unlimited amount of debt for a quasi-municipal form of government where we aren't on the board and the ownership of the property can change hands and we don't know. Can you tell me, you know, give me this risk assessment too. Would you invest in this? Well, I'm happy to respond. Um, I'm Jim Manier with VLX Group and I serve as the city's independent financial advisor for public finance matters and capital improvement financing and have been part of the city's team uh, to review this request as it's been um, discussed so far. I think I'd like to just respond from the point of view of the city's um, Metro District policy, which was approved really to uh, give the city comfort about the nature of the Metro Districts that, that were developed within the city, and in fact is um, the source of the 50 mil cap that Harvest Junction Metro is now asked to be um, um, w um, uh, r raised for an unlimited melody purpose. Um, basically, I think that ordinance and the policy has served its purpose because we have seen Harvest Junction happily be one of the uh, metro districts that's performed well, developed uh, as projected, and provided um, a strong tax base as well as the sales tax revenue to the city that were presented uh, by Alex. Um, so my assessment uh, is that um, the risk has mostly been ironed out and, uh, in this district. And, and, and as we talk about the progression of assessed value, uh, we begin to talk in terms of the district maturing or reaching st stabilization. 
and uh, we've we've seen good performance. And I think at this point, um, the request that comes from the district is uh, a reasonable one. Uh, they're they're looking to move into a fixed rate mode, which a number of variable rate borrowers at this point in time are making similar evaluations and similar uh, determinations about whether they want to move into a fixed payment and out of the variable rate that's been productive for them for the last few years. Um, so from my point of view, I haven't uh, seen any need to uh, advise the city of risk that I see associated with this proposal. Yes, we are in, if, if the city responds favorably to the proposal and the, the millivy cap is removed, there is a theoretical scenario where it, the millivy someday could ex exceed 50 mils, but we have evidence basically that the stabilization has taken place and the likelihood of that, again, I think is, is extremely remote. I also uh, uh, admired Mr. Brown's candor in his description of the investors in the public finance market who are looking for uh, reasons that they can use to extract higher interest rates. And 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 there is a big, I'd say, uh, credit quality distinction in the eyes of the rating agencies between uh, districts which come to market or come for ratings and still have a millivy cap in place compared to those that, that like um, more traditional general obligation borrowers operate without a, a, a millivy cap of any type. So I, I see the rationale and the logic that uh, uh, exists in the, the district's proposal. Um, uh, would I buy the bonds? Um, if I would, I would be more comfortable buying the bonds if there was an unlimited uh, pledge. And that I think is, is the, the motivation behind uh, that, that, that the district is seeking. So I, I hope I'm responding in the spirit of your question. I know that you have concerns about the city's safety as do I and your staff as well. Well, and, and I guess, you know, um, it, it will keep me up at night to, to know that, you know, no one thought this was going to happen this week with J.P. Morgan Chase. Nobody thought that Bear Stearns was going to fail. And, um, you know, I, this is the kind of thing where, you know, is this going to come back to haunt you? Um, certainly anybody can, any um, investor, just like when we're, you're helping us with our bond issues, can ding us for any reason to, to have that a little bit more interest rate so that they can make more money for their investors too. I mean, it's sort of like the, the dog chasing its tail a bit. Um, you know, however, what, what I um, noted in your response was that we have a good ordinance on special districts, um, but you know, there still is a lingering um, part of risk out there and, and um, you know, this may be the best, again, this may be the best thing for this district, but I also see that there's risk moving forward in this district when the Twin Peaks Mall gets redeveloped. So again, the um, this district has gone this way while the mall has gone this way. We may end up with some kind of a reversal. And looking forward um, in the future to set, um, to consider uh, so, so maybe effortlessly, uh, a policy that that removes a, a cap, and knowing that that we're going to be considering other special districts in the future, um, you know, it, it makes me uh, it gives me some pause. And I understand all the market dynamics and everything, but I'm looking for really what's going to be the best thing protecting the city long term. And if there's only a one percent chance, some people would call me stupid to say you're not looking at even the 1% or the half percent chance. Understood. I think um, the, the uh, just one comment with respect to the market being unnerved by the derivatives losses at J.P. Morgan, what, what Harvest Junction is doing is moving into a more conservative debt structure. They're moving away from variable rate uh, debt and into fixed rate, and so to some extent, they'll play with more predictability now than, than under the current arrangement. So um, if there's, if that's an adequate answer, I'll have a seat. Council Member Santos. Thank you. Um, wow. Jim, what do you need? All right, Kumas, members of council, we, we don't need anything tonight. We wanted to bring this to your attention because it will be coming before you on the 5th of June, 
uh, for action at that time. So okay. we wanted to answer any questions you had tonight before that came to you then. Well, I'm sure some of these same questions will come back up that uh, we brought up tonight. And not all of us are financial wizards, but, uh, you know, um, Dee and, uh, and Jim has, haven't steered us wrong, and hopefully they won't steer us wrong yet. So I'm actually very comfortable, and we'll sleep very comfortably with uh, the proposal that is, is being brought forth. Um, you know, the only thing I would have to say to um, Harvest Junction Special District, as Alex mentioned, um, make sure that you, bring, you get your uh, financial reports in on time. You know, that, you know, I can't think of a person who was ever, you know, who may not have been late on a payment of something or of some sort. Um, if, you, if you have, uh, if you've never missed a payment, wow, you've done a really good job, or never missed the deadline, Wow, you, you've done, you're outstanding and probably in that 1%. So um, I would just be cautious about um, bringing up other um, companies that may or may not have done very well in the last several days. Because if you look back on the hi history of uh, financial trades, in, you know, since financial trades have been going on, some companies have survived and some companies haven't. So um, that's how it goes. And uh, I look forward to seeing this come in uh, on June 5th. Councilmember Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coons. This all makes very, very good sense to me, and it looks to me like our position is stronger when this happens. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it coming back. And I would suggest that if others have questions, that perhaps they, uh, they um, get those questions answered uh, when this is on our agenda next time. Mayor, um, one thing, if I could point out, please. Um, you know, we, we should make it clear up front, just in case there's any misunderstanding, that the city is not guaranteeing these bonds, and so there's no responsibility on the city's part to, uh, to pay this debt in any, any uh, situation, regardless of what happens with the district. So that's part of what the unlimited mill levy does, it gives the district the ability to take care of it. So. Councilmember Levison. Yes, thank you. Mr. Brown, since you did offer to um, maybe look at having a part of the agreement that would um, uh, look at what kind of an investment policy you would have, maybe similar to what the city has for some investment policies, um, I think that that would, um, you know, help me. And I, I'm wondering if um, Mr. Weiser, Mr. Meniers could give us some guidance about what would be, Meniere would give us some uh, guidance around what would make sense because we have those kind of adopted policies as well and to streamline something similar to what the city has I think would be a benefit. I'm getting out in front of my client and sight unseen. Um, I think we'd be happy to adopt the same policies the city has adopted. Yeah. Uh, you know, I su suggest that you all get your heads together and, and try to work out something. There's no sense in us trying to um, get down to the nitty gritty about it. Councilmember Ragley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I mean, just also, I, I think it's a great plan. I incur, I'm also on board. I'll vote for it. In a nutshell, um, private property owners are the people who make the best decision for their property. And if it ever gets in trouble, there's no reason to think that city council can do anything about it. So uh, in the event that I wasn't clear when I was making my comments, I think you've got direction from council that go nuts. Well, thank you for the presentation. Let's take a five minute break.
Let's resume our uh, meeting. So, uh, do you want to introduce the next uh, item, Don? Mayor, the next uh, item about Focus on Longmont will be introduced by Karen Roney, Director of Community Services. Thank you, Don. And Mayor, members of City Council, Karen Roney with Community Services. And um, tonight, Sandy Cedar, right over here, and I will be... Um, uh, basically reviewing a, a draft of the Focus on Longmont update uh, for Council's review and input. So tonight, really what we're looking for is, is uh, as we said in the communication, um, any particular um, revisions that you would suggest that we make in Focus on Longmont. So if there's anything in terms of the strategies or actions that you think we need to add or revise or get rid of that's that's really what we're wanting to hear from uh, this evening and and then we can uh, make those revisions and bring back for city council adoption in um, in June and so um, thanks quick it'll be a brief PowerPoint sure. just to keep sure. us on focus here the um, so as, as council certainly is, is aware that um, our original focus on Lamont plan was completed in in 2006. And basically, it uh, served as a, um, as a planning tool that really helped to determine in, in what areas that the city wanted to uh, focus or place additional emphasis to make sure that Longmont was a great place to live now and into the future. And at that point in time, um, we were growing very fast. And before we reached build out of our planning area, we wanted to make sure that we had in place what we needed to make sure that Longmont remained vibrant um, and, uh, and sustainable as we com um, completed build out. The, um, and since 2006, that focus on Longmont plan has helped provide some guidance to our city councils. In, um, and really when you looked at your annual work plans and you looked at the um, goals and what you wanted to focus on for the upcoming year, that Focus on Lama did serve as a, as a planning tool and informed your, um, your work plans and um, from councils since 2006. And because it also helped to inform your work plan that you developed in, uh, earlier in April, that um, we are actually bringing back not only the Focus on Lama draft tonight, but also integrating that with your um, proposed work plan for 2012. So I'm um, going take the lead on focus on Lamont. Sandy's taking the lead on the, the work plan and anything in between. So what uh, in 2011, in the 2011 work plan, what City Council at that point in time um, encouraged us to do was as staff is to refresh the policies and implementation strategies that were included in that 2006 plan. The overarching strategic directions, which we've highlighted here and which you've heard about quite a bit, um, that council believed were, um, you know, were constant, still were very much in effect. They were broad enough. They still are um, something worthy of um, working on and striving for. But really what you wanted to, to have us to do is to refresh those policies and those action steps to see um, what we might want to um, maybe get rid of or we've already accomplished, what new things might um, we need to consider given trends and some of the, um, the council preferences that, um, that you had. So really what Focus on Longmont um, provides is a longer term strategic direction for council and, um, and for the City of Longmont organization not specifically the community, but our organization. But what's different about Focus on Lama is that it did have and did incorporate broad 
community support, and that was by design when the original 2006 plan was um, was developed. The intent, as I just mentioned, is that those strategic directions were to remain constant. Um, and that any kinds of changes in um, actions would um, would really happen over time based on different council members' priorities or what you all felt were the most important things to focus on in focus on, on Longmont based on trends and needs and, and council's priorities. These um, The plan and the implementation strategies are reflected in your annual work plans and goals and and it also influences our City of Longmont operational plans, which really takes the form of our annual um, budget, which you'll be looking at probably pretty darn soon <laughs> in, a, in a couple of months or so. So what you have in front of you and that's outlined in the communication is, uh, is the proposed update for Focus on Longmont. You will see that we have ident identified three different tiers and um, tier one basically means that this is um, this really came up as, as a new area of uh, importance or really a renewed effort that we heard from the community. So either either something new or something that the community said you know this is really still important and please please spend time and effort on that. Tier two is really a support of ongoing efforts that uh, the community said these strategies are still really important and that they encourage the city to continue to um, pay attention to those and, and work on those. Tier three were um, those items were really, they came in as a lower priority and that could have been for a variety of reasons. Maybe what we had in the 2006 plan had already been accomplished and done, check that off the list. Or maybe it just didn't come up um, as a high priority. Things obviously change over a five, six year period and we just didn't get a lot of traction for, for, some, of those, um, for some of those efforts. So what we really want to do this evening is uh, hit, the, hit the highlights. Um, I will assume that you have all had the opportunity to review this document and um, if you have any questions, we will be glad to try to answer those. We also have staff in the audience that were um, heavily involved in putting together this, this draft. So the strategies for, um, the recommended strategies for Focus on Lama are in on page, uh, start on page 41 of your council packet and run through page uh, 54 if you want all the, all the details. So in tier one for promoting a healthy business climate, you know, what you will see is the um, recommended uh, strategies remain to be uh, primary jobs, increasing those job opportunities uh, within, um, within the Lama community, continuing with um, business support so that all businesses of all different ranges uh, can provide job opportunities and we can have economic diversity in our community, which, um, which the community and I believe council believes is very important. And also to um, focus on the Twin Peaks Mall redevelopment. And, um, and obviously this is some, some of these things are uh, carryover items in your work plan and um, that uh, still remain to be important and, and viable. In the, for education in tier one, the two areas are community support for education. And this is in regard to, um, I think what the community said is that the, what the city should really focus on in this area are those things that the city does best. And so one of the things in, uh, for this particular strategy really had to do with infrastructure. So our facilities, our, obviously our, our telecommunication utilities, some of our um, land and other things that we can um, bring to the table that can really help support a full range of educational opportunities, that that's where the, the city should focus its effort. So, um, so we talked a little bit about this at the council retreat, but certainly looking at um, you know how we leverage our telecom um, utility and helping to make sure that um, all of our families and students have access to High-speed broadband service is uh, is something that not, is just not nice to have, but it's it's probably it's required um, for uh, being able to uh, have academic success throughout the um, throughout the K through 12 education. The other area was uh, about city leadership, and again, these um, these two areas are included in your um, 2012 draft 
work plan, but um, but really that the um, what the city can do is uh, is provide leadership and be strong in promoting messages and helping to generate support throughout all sectors of the community of um, why educational is foundation to um, all of our success as community members here in Longmont. For tier one activities under enhancing the natural environment, uh, continuing to connect our trails, greenways, and bike paths. This is one that was in 2006, and we heard from the community that uh, keep on keeping on. This is really important. It's it's one of the um, uh, great assets of our community that we should continue to focus on. The um, open space um, and parks and opportunities, uh, recreation opportunities. And again, this is something that we are looking at in 2012. It's about really making sure that um, we have a park maintenance standard that the city supports and um, and is willing to uh, to fund and, and look at our long-term financial stability for making sure our park system uh, remains uh, vibrant and sustainable. Public transit also came up as a, a as an area of focus, as well as the St. Brain River Corridor, which, again, you talked about and it, you'll see in your draft work plan for 2012. Tier 1 for focus on downtown, making sure that downtown is a, um, is a vibrant destination and, and gathering place, as well as uh, that downtown offers a, a mix of um, economically viable businesses. So those areas did seem to continue to be um, important as it related to um, it related to focus on Lama. And the last tier one section had to do with community identity and cultural inclusion. And this is where we uh, continue to hear that it's important to offer a variety of um, activities for youth so that youth have um, Opportunities to be uh, to for healthy youth development and to uh, continue to cr contribute as adults in uh, in our community once they have uh, uh, moved from transition from youth to adulthood. That we continue to look at diversity of leadership in um, all facets of the community, not just within the city of Longmont organization, and also to focus on our continuing um, efforts for meaningful community involvement, so that all voices. Um, do get heard um, and considered as we are considering important um, policy matters in future directions of, um, of the city. So that is a quick overview of our Tier 1 recommendations, which the community said these are really important. Um, these are new. Keep on focusing on those. So I thought I would just see if there are any questions about any of the Tier 1 strategies or action steps in these five areas before we hit tier two. Okay. Oh. One, one quick question. Um, you know, the river corridor, it could actually follow under two categories. You know, one is enhancing the natural environment, so you picked it up there. But uh, it could also, um, fall under the category of promoting a healthy business climate because it's, it's kind of an overlapping oh. thing. Just just my comment on that. So go ahead. Right. Um, and Mayor Coombs, we, we did certainly notice that um, in, in a few areas when we were going through the planning effort. And um, so we tried to make note of that and, and eventually just landed on yeah. Where, right. where, where to, where to place it? But certainly, there were um, several interconnections with with some of these strategies and areas. So, tier two. Nope. Go ahead. Okay, tier two. Again, keep on doing these. Um, and in the um, healthy business climate, the business friendly environment. Um, you can see here, and this is really where I think the, the uh, eliminating or addressing red tape item showed up in your discussion at your April retreat, as well as continuing to effectively market um, our community to potential businesses, employers, and visitors. In supporting education for Tier 2, the uh, community talked about really continuing to um, support some of the city services that we offer that really try to fill some of the gaps in um, in learning resources and, and opportunities. So looking at, in particular, what people talked about were the services and opportunities that we make available through our local public library. And, um, and again, our role is to kind of look for where there are some gaps that it makes 
sense for the city to fill, not necessarily to try to duplicate, duplicate or be redundant in other efforts. Early education support was also included here, and we had an opportunity to talk about this in, um, in April. And then the, um, the last area of uh, continued focus is, uh, is lifelong learning and, and how we continue to provide those opportunities for um, adults uh, throughout their careers and, and into, into retirement. The tier two for enhanced natural environment, open space you'll see is uh, still a high priority, as well as continuing to offer our various conservation programs um, that help to reduce energy and water consumption um, with, within our, our community. Sandy's multitasking here. So I'm uh, focused on downtown for tier two, uh, continuing to uh, make sure that downtown is pedestrian friendly, clean and safe, and that, that basically people wanna come and hang out in downtown and do lots of cool things and, um, and, and spend money and enjoy themselves. For community identity and cultural inclusion, we uh, some of the neighborhood efforts show up here where, um, where the community said it's um, great that the city supports its, its neighborhood groups and also to con continue to look at how we offer uh, different kinds of activities within the neighborhood, how we help the community and, and our neighborhood groups to um, reach out and bring in new neighborhoods as well as whatever kind of mechanisms to help our group leaders communicate and keep residents within their neighborhood informed of what kinds of uh, great things are, are happening. The culturally inclusive gatherings provided, uh, again, they were uh, supported. And what the community indicated to, um, to us was really continue to look at how, um, how we try to build greater understanding and build relationships across cultures uh, beyond the party. So um, the celebrations are great, and how do we continue to um, really enhance and, and develop those, um, those lasting um, relationships between uh, cultures? And then safety continues. Is uh, it is important for um, folks within our neighborhoods to feel like uh, that they are safe, and uh, and that really helps with the sense of uh, community and, and sense of belonging. So those are tier two recommendations, and I wonder if there are any questions, changes, comments about those. Council Member Bagley, is that it? thank you, Mayor Coombs? Is that it? First of all for focus on LAMA, and then we're going to talk about the work plan. I'll wait then. Okay. Well, thank you, Karen. Okay, so that must mean that I'm a Zandy Cedar Assistant to the City Manager, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how Focus on Longmont um, really works in with your City Council work plan. So uh, oftentimes I am asked around how does Focus on Longmont fit into different pieces of city planning. The Focus on Longmont strategic plan, the original plan, and certainly this update, really was talking with residents around the idea of what should the city look like kind of at build-out. Now, everyone, I think, knows that we didn't hit build-out, <laughs> but we certainly had lots of declining development, and, and uh, I'm glad to hear the experts behind me saying that that looks like it's turning around, because that's wonderful. But when we first talked about Focus on Mama, we talked about what are the things that the city needs to continue doing to be a sustainable, viable, a wonderful place to be and live into the future, well into the future. And so that's what created the first five categories. Obviously, those first five categories are broad, and the pieces that come underneath them, the different strategies and the actions, are the pieces in which each council then takes and, and moves forward as they find to be appropriate. Um, that's happened with every council since 2006, and you all um, did a great job in picking and choosing the types of things even before the update is out. So you, you took a look at the things that were starting to emerge that your residents were saying through the Focus on Online update in these five areas and picked four of them to talk about during your city council retreat. So really and truly, what you have done is already started the implementation of Focus on Longmont, the kind of the second edition, even before we got the, the report finalized. You're very quick. So um, those those four things, uh, first of all, I should talk a little bit about the carryover items from the past work plans, which includes uh, economic sustainability and primary job incentives. This was something that you all had said, yes, carry this over into the, into the current work plan. Um, retail recruitment and envision a connected city telecom, which could have probably stopped at the last work plan, except that the voters said 
move forward with that. And so uh, you all decided to continue that as part of your work plan. Um, the four new topics that you chose really from the feedback from Focus on Longmont to move forward include the St. Vrain River Corridor, education collaboration, parks planning and renewal, and reducing red tape. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what those look like in just a second. But I just wanted to kind of uh, explain the tie between what Focus on Longmont does, the council picks and chooses which priorities they have, each council has, in order to move forward, and then the city staff takes that and budgets that um, and, and actually starts that work reporting back to you quarterly. The Focus on Longmont tool, this draft report, really does give, it, it really is a strategic planning tool that each council can take and, and move through. So we're, we're going to double check on the strategies and, and actions in just a second. But what I really want to talk about is how does this fit with the city council work plan? So you all should have that in front of you. Don, if you wouldn't mind throwing back on those lights. Rather than put that into a PowerPoint, um, it starts on page 55 of your council packet. And what we really have done is taken the agreed to proposals and purpose that we um, started with from your direction at the council retreat, and we have added meat to it, we hope. We hope good meat, so to speak. Um, and so for the first one, actually for the first three, economic sustainability, retail recruitment, and envision a connected city, these are really the next steps in these processes. So for example, under economic sustainability, really taking a look at the incentive packages, this goes right along with focus on Longmont, um, and, and making sure that we are meeting the, the needs of incentives for primary employers specifically. The retail recruitment, as you all know, we have hired a retail recruitment consultant who will be bringing back some information to a council meeting, I believe, in June, maybe it's July. June? All right, June. Um, and so this is really just a continuation of that work and really pulling that all the way through. Of course, you will have some very exciting retail opportunities with the redevelopment of the Twin Peaks Mall also. Um, the next one, which is envision, envision a connected city, which is, okay, now we have the right to use the telecom. What are we going to do with it? And so this really begins to outline that process um, that really starts with the community engagement process. And so what are we looking for here, and, and what kind of technologies are there out there that we can really make the most of what the voters have, have uh, allowed us to do? So then we start with, kind of, with the new items. Um, and I guess it's kind of, it's a good transition because St. Vrain River Corridor was on the last work plan. Um, this is now on this work plan and really talks about a strategic plan that marries up the CIP and the infrastructure investment with the community engagement pieces. So I, I do believe I was listening pretty closely to everything that, uh, that Mr. Schmatzmeyer had said, and I think that all those elements are in here. Really talking about hiring on the right consultants at the right time, really bringing in some of the capital pieces and getting the community engagement process. And it's going to be several stages for, for those of you who uh, who uh, understand the whole community involvement framework that we use. There are going to be times in which we're going to be working with property owners uh, more heavily maybe than the general public, but there's going to be a time and a place for each of those levels of involvement in the St. Vrain River Corridor project. The education collaboration. Sorry. Oh. Can I just ask a quick question there? Now, one of the things that we had discussed um, just in general terms was the, the master plan, the whole thing, or um, not. And I don't think we really came up with a clear, definitive answer on that at the council retreat. Um, and the stuff that we have... Uh, highlighted here, it seems like this is just doing the pre-work before we can do that. Is is that kind of your take on it? I, the, the way that I had seen it was the idea that we're really creating the master plan for the development and capital renewal of, of, of the okay. oh, sorry of that piece. And so I, I think it's I think it's multifaceted. So if you're asking the question, did we decide the entire? River Corridor, right. I think the answer was no. no I think the answer was that. that we were going to do some master planning and some strategic planning around where do the CIP pieces right. come in for that significant infrastructure, and then where do the economic pieces come in, and then where does the community involvement. Those three sections together need to work in concert. And so starting at first in Maine, at the first in Maine site, and working out um, is, is sort of the way that I understood mm -hmm. it. Um, and are we going to be able to um, get through this in a year? Ooh, that's a good question. It's a good question. Uh, yes, actually, the, des the desire is that we move quickly through this in terms of how we approach the process and, and how we look at these issues because we also have capital expenditures that are going to come in play later this year and then in 2013. 
And so what we want to do is um, really effectively utilize those dollars in conjunction with the overall project. And so when we talk about the different phases being involved in this process, there's actually going to be a lot of parallel work going on in terms of how we approach this and, and what we look at um, and, and how we move forward because we, we really have to make sure that we're staying on the time frame in, term of the cap in terms of the capital projects, but that it really works in concert with the larger vision of the river and how we move forward. Is that and Council Member, what you, you you may uh, you may notice in the council work plan that there are a couple pieces that really are 2014 types of projects, like the bridge mm -hmm. design and other right. things. Um, so so the planning piece probably does look like it's a this year type of thing, but obviously the capital and the design projects, those things take a little longer. And so you'll notice that um, for the final bridge design, for the per, for the preliminary channel design, we have that as second quarter of 2014, um, and then the, the funding and the scheduling for the bridge improvements really talking about how to how to accelerate that infrastructure investment in 2013. So we have to accelerate the channel design mm -hmm. so you can actually get the bridge design in place so then you can move to final design um, in, in a way that makes sense because if we go in and actually start working on the bridge design in a preliminary concept and then to the final design without really looking at the channel then we're creating issues and so that's when we're going to accelerate one aspect mm -hmm. to ultimately deal with the total package. Yeah, I guess the piece that I, I, I'm looking for and I don't see exactly is is doing, um, I see that we're going to obviously reach out to the private property owners, but the, the piece that was really exciting to me was uh, community engagement and, and getting everybody involved in our community project and and I see that obviously yeah we need to there are some things that you know community really isn't going to have much say on like <laughs> you know infrastructure that's that's not too fun to to talk about but the community engagement piece are we going to get to that this year or or not what do you think yes late yes. late this year um when you look at identifying leverage, private foundation, and nonprofit investment opportunities, I think that we put that in second, third quarter of this year, correct? Okay. So Is that what that means? Oh, okay. All right. I didn't read it that way. Thanks. And Mayor Coops, Council Member Witt, you know, there was, there actually was a very specific piece about engagement. So I'm going to make sure that it's really spelled out when it comes back for your final approval, if that works for you. Okay. Council Member Levison. Thank you. I think one of the challenges that we recognized when we held our retreat in April is that whatever we did on this work plan, you know, we wouldn't maybe be able to get everything done in six months. And I don't think there's ever been an expectation where every piece of a council work plan for that year gets tied up in a neat bow by the end of the year. Because we all have, uh, we've seen carryovers, and, and I really um, uh, support this, this uh uh, piece on the, the work plan, but also recognizing that um, uh, in the fall might be a really good time for people to go out there and explore the river on their own, that, that corridor and the pathways next to it, and help envision it. In the middle of the winter, it will be really hard for us to get people down there walking, unless we have a very mild winter. So I, I'm thinking that we could capitalize on some of the, you know, excitement, and also with what we know might come forward with a Great Outdoors Colorado grant for some of those other parallel processes like the grants. We'll be able to keep building on that kind of thing. But I, I look at this as we'll begin some of this work, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that we don't keep working on it and bringing up the profile. I think the first thing we need to do, and I think this is where I'm hearing Council Member Witt's concern is that we bring this up to the level that community starts talking about it. I see you nodding your head. So, uh, you know, I, I fully support that. I think that um, whatever we can do to, to get kind of the um, that as an action item to start promoting this planning, um, the the planning we're going to do around it, and then when we talk at the cap around the conversations with budget and capital projects, I think that we can continue to build that momentum with um, how we we look at aligning our capital. Um, priorities. Councilmember Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Um, just looking at page 25, 
what you're asking from us. Are there any proposed strategies or action steps in the draft plan update that council wishes to? I don't know about council, but the two things that I'd like that I'd recommend is one, I know that we have quarters in here. I, I personally, in my office, I mean, when we have a work plan, you know, I want to get it done. And so rather than seeing like quarters and well, we'll kind of focus on, I'd like to see deadlines. Um, deadlines stimulate progress. Just throw them in. And then uh, number two, uh, once you have a deadline, uh, who, who's the one person ultimately responsible on staff for making sure the deadline gets met? I think that those two things will make sure that we don't go another year without progress on the river corridor or something else. Because uh, I, I don't think there's anything in there that we can't make significant progress on. And then uh, two, are there any additional priorities? I don't see any. I think you nailed it. And then number three, does it reflect what I think council's direction from the April, April retreat was? Yes. So, Mayor Coombs, I did want to just mention, sure. um, on, you know, one piece around the, the St. Brain River Corridor also um, is the idea that it is multi-year. There are lots of marketing efforts that we can talk about. There are lots of things that can indeed go along with the CIP. I think one of the suggestions from the council was to identify any of these bridge projects that are river corridor types of projects so that we're really kind of building that in the community. We do want to be careful, though, that when we're engaging the community that we're not engaging them on something that's not going to happen for two years, but really talking about the overall plan and building some of that excitement certainly should be part of it. I do just want to kind of finish the, the work plan piece. The education collaboration um, does talk a lot about the leadership role that you were just speaking of, um, as well as bringing together different entities, different educational entities, and leveraging the city's infrastructure, uh, namely the telecom, which is also another one of your strategic goals. Um, and then find, uh, the parks planning and renewal. Um, so I saw the RFPs flying back and forth today with the scope of service for this already being placed on the street pretty quickly for RFP. So um, I think the intention is to, once a consultant is determined and, uh, and all of that put together, that it's a nine-month planning process. And so they are uh, really working hard to start moving for forward with that. You may see some appropriations coming forward in order to make sure that that can happen. Um, and then the, the last piece is reducing red tape. This one uh, was very interesting because when we started to look at the different action steps, there were lots of different departments that were um, part of this, not only economic development, but also uh, the city clerk's office, and, and you'll start to see some of those things coming out soon. Uh, Mayor Council, as we really look at the red tape and, and we talk about the, and you all touched on it in terms of the river discussions, what we're really finding is that that item really extends beyond economic development and is an issue that we're frankly going to work on as an organization. So when Council Member Bagley talked about setting hard deadlines and establishing folks so we can actually meet those deadlines, move quickly, and we can accomplish that, that's actually something that, that's really core to my vision in terms of how I want an organization to work and operate. Um, as I've talked to a number of groups, um, I stated that I really want an organization that moves with a, at a quick pace with a sense of urgency. Um, it's dynamic and it's creative and it's flexible. And, and so I think as we look at the strategic plan that we talked about in terms of red tape, it's going to be a broader organizational strategic plan. Um, as I've begun meeting with departments, one of the things that I've discovered in those meetings is that we have a number of operational strategic plans throughout the organization. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an organizational plan that ties all of those strategic plans together and, and then so that ultimately makes it difficult to tie with the council work plan. Um, and, and the other problem that it really creates for an organization is how do we move um, as an organization with a common sense of purpose and, and move quickly in, ad in adapting and adopting and working with all of the issues that you all put in your, your work plan. So. You know, the overall strategic plan that I'm looking for in terms of the organization, um, a strategic plan for the broader organization in terms of how we, how we operate is actually one step in the process. We're also going to be focusing on the structure of the organization to really create a, a system that can move quickly and we can accomplish things within a reasonable time frame. And, and, and frankly, we can move aggressively. Um, and then we also want to work in terms of creating an organizational culture that fundamentally empowers our employees at all levels um, to utilize their respective talents 
um, that ultimately creates an organization that's solution oriented and is clear on its mission so we can move collectively toward a common goal. And so when, when you all talk about moving quickly, accomplishing things within a defined period of time, I really fundamentally believe that it's something we can do as an organization and provide the council with tangible results. Um, part of that process is going to be focusing us um, as an organization and then tying the operational strategic plans to the larger organizational strategic plan. And what I mean is not necessarily something that, that we talk about in terms of the policy issues, but how we work as staff to accomplish the policy directives that council gives to us. Um, and then just frankly empowering folks within the organization to move quickly. So, Mayor, where that fits in kind of in the overall structure is that the City Council has the Focus on Longmont report, which is the strategic planning tool that, the, that is community supported, that creates your council work plan. And what Harold's talking about is that next level of operational organization and strategic planning, which, is, which currently takes place in several departmental plans. And so tying those things together to really create um, the synergy through the rest of the organization. And frankly, we're going to have to move quickly because we're moving into the budget process, we're moving into the CIP process and all of these aspects start touching each other. And, and as we talk about the goals and what we're trying to accomplish, uh, we saw it in the parks discussion in terms of the sustainability, in terms of ongoing maintenance and how we um, address our capital needs. So those are some things that we're gonna have to accelerate within the plan to deal with in this budget process and as we continue moving forward. Uh, and then as, as we go through this process next year, um, one of the things that will then be embedded and focus on Longmont is is that operational financial review in terms of are we sustainable? How are we going to take care of ourselves in the future? And can we continue funding those operational requirements? So that's going to be something that we're going to bring to the table, but we have to generate it in this financial process this year. And Mayor Coombs, the last piece is I, I believe, and maybe I'm stepping out of turn here, but I believe the person who's responsible for holding everyone to these deadlines is your newly appointed city manager. <laughs> And with that, the, the questions that we do have are um, really regarding the entire strategic plan, the entire focus on Longmont plan, um, and really looking at those tier one, those tier two, and we didn't put up the tier threes because of things that we're kind of moving away from. Um, but are there any strategic goals or actions or anything to that effect that you feel needs to be changed? Um, I, I recognize Councilmember Bagley is good. Um, and then are there any other priorities that you want to include in your work plan that wasn't there? And then, and then as he said, um, does this really reflect what you'd like to see in the next year from our staff? Councilmember Robinson. Thank you. Um, for the focus on Longmont, I think that the point that one of the speakers today, the public invited to be heard, pointed out is that um, in order to um, uh, accomplish some of the goals of uh, that plan, we're going to need to use more than just the usual suspects to make it very um, uh, embedded in the community since th those are initiatives that came from the community. So I would be interested in seeing how uh, we could flex our muscles with the various citizen board and commissions and then maybe some of the other organizations like um, the LMAC, the person that is speaker is from LMAC, the multicultural plan to see um, there may not, there may be other ways to do the um, healthy business climate with retail recruiting that might come from the ethnic communities. Um, it might come from other areas we didn't think about, but to leave ourselves open to a possibility of how we leverage all the different resources in the community. Um, and then as far as the work plan, the one piece that I find missing on the Envision a Connected City Telecom, there's no mention at all that we're going to have a goal of, of getting that new contract with Comcast. That I think we've overlooked that, and I don't know if we want to add that on the council work plan, because are we not supposed to have that contract negotiated by the, the end of this year, or when would we be doing that? Uh, Mayor Coombs and Councilmember Lipson, I believe that's a 2013. Yeah, it's for two years. Yeah, okay. so 2013. Yeah. So I'm wondering, should we add the beginning, the work on that, because that falls within the um, the telecom. That could also fall within the. Um, the focus of Longmont um, goal about trying to get as many people connected to the internet. Um, that's just a, a suggestion. I think that we should have something in there about um, negotiating the new um, uh, cable trust, uh, the cable franchise agreement.
think, Mayor, because we, we yeah. will be we will be negotiating yeah. that yeah. agreement. So yeah. <laughs> placing it in there. Yeah. Is, uh, I would add, ask any concerns in terms of what we talked about in, in creating an organizational strategic plan, uh, working on the um, the culture issues and the structure. Um, any concerns from council on that and, and how we move forward? Council Member Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I think that's an excellent idea and I'm looking forward to it. I guess I'll uh, second Bonnie's uh, comments. I think we're uh, on the right track and uh, I'm excited uh, that you have the philosophy that knows not a good answer and uh, that we are um, going to work in our organization to help our rev tape. I think that's it's not just economic development, it's an organizational issue. So, Mayor Coombs, if there are no other questions or any other feedback, we'll be bringing back the, the draft plan into final version as well as the council work plan into final version in June. Well, thank you. You did a very good job presentation, and so did Karen. So thank you for all your hard work. Quick question. Oh, Council Member Witt. I do have a quick question about calendaring. And did we did we settle on the calendar options or no? Uh, Mayor Coombs, Council Member Witt, you'll notice in your packet that is either on your desk or in your drop box is a council communication from Valerie Skitt outlining all of the proposed cancellations for 2012. Um, and so there are a couple of different pieces in that. One is that obviously your meeting for May 29th is canceled. Um, it, it's, it should be in your consent. It should be under the consent agenda in your packets for, t for next week. Yes, so the ones that you just got because you can't act on it in the study session, so it's there for a regular session. But basically the 29th would be canceled. Um, there are a couple in June that would be canceled. As Jim, as Jim alluded to, we would turn June 5th into a regular session in order to accommodate some of the pieces that are happening with Twin Peaks Mall and with Harvest Junction. Um, the only things that we were not able to accommodate was um, in September there was a request for a study session to be canceled. We, we are asking council not to cancel that because you'd have to add Thursday in order to meet the budget deadlines, which was something you all had asked to get that information about. And then August, there was a suggestion to cancel one of the uh, sessions in August, but that's ballot season, and so you, you, we want to make sure that all the ballot issues do have the opportunity to hit first and second readings in August. And everything else that you all suggested seems to work out just fine. So if you take a look at that council communication next week at your regular meeting, you'll be able to pass that on consent, and then that becomes the, tw the 2012 calendar. Um, we're working on the 2013, and we'll bring that back to you probably in the next month or so. Thank you. Thank you. I do just want to thank everyone that worked on Focus on Mama. I know, I know um, Michelle is back there, Michelle Waite and Karen and all of the directors and all the members of the coordinating team, as well as everybody who even picked up the phone during the telephone town hall and participated in that. We ended up with hundreds of participants and they weren't the usual suspects and it was really a fantastic opportunity. And so I thank you for letting me work on it and I want to thank everybody who was part of it. Okay. Do you want to get the Mayor, the next item um, regarding election ward boundaries will be presented by Valerie Skitt, the city clerk. Mayor Coombs and members of council, I'm Valerie Skitt, and there was a pre-recorded presentation on this item in your packets, so I'm basically here to answer questions and just receive direction from you on um, whether our plan of action and our community involvement process is what you, something you can uh, support. Council Member Witt. All I have to say is I win because I have the most people in my ward. Council Member. I was just going to make a snide comment. You know, amongst the wards, <laughs> I have the best ward. <laughs> Council Member Levison. Yes, um, it, just just a couple of things. Um, in, uh, I'm glad to see that, that we're going to do outreach to NGLA. Um, when I was looking at that item, I think that it would be really important to try to keep, um, if there is a HOA neighborhood, to try to also see that it stay, the entire neighborhood stays in a certain ward because when the neighborhood group leaders are trying to communicate, you know, they get a call or an email message, what ward is our neighborhood? 
I don't want them to, to feel that responsibility to be the public information officer on elections, but to, to think that we would have a neighborhood that would be split, um, that's the same HOA group. I'm just looking at the way people identify themselves, and, and I don't know. Uh, we'll have to take a look and see how that happens with precincts, too. Um, but I agree to try to keep precincts whole, and if we can keep you know, neighborhoods whole, at least the HOA boundary of the neighborhood. That, um, that I think that that would be, make it easier for people to get a grasp of, of what ward they're in, for example. And we'll, we'll take a look at that with planning's help and see if they've got those boundaries and where we can, we will do that. And then um, if we could add and, um, or substitute something like an open house event where we just have, you know, uh, a one-shot deal where everybody could come in and take a look at the ward lines and have a discussion if they wanted to have a discussion with people. Um, I think that would be um, maybe more effective than doing the festivals because it's very difficult to talk to people substantively at festivals we did on have, this kind of an issue. We did have a, list, uh, a minimum of two open houses under the on the road staff presentations. Okay, we do have that. Okay, well, and and I guess maybe. It, maybe looking at doing them in a little bit different fashion. Um, and, and then uh, I would also suggest if we're going to have boards up in um, the Civic Center, that maybe we move those those information boards down to the reception area outside of City Council for Tuesday evening meetings so people that happen to come in to speak at Public Invited Be Heard can have, you know, if they're they're waiting or something, they can have the, the information there easy to, to look at. So those are really the, uh, the comments I had. And I think that um, uh, the only thing I heard from 10 years ago is that there were a lot of people, um, the comment that I heard was that people thought that this, the process the last time in 2003 happened very quickly and not pe many people were aware of the, the process or the fact that until almost too late to give public comment. Um, the reason where boundary lines were being drawn and, and how that was determined. So that's the feedback I remember from 10 years ago from my neighbors. Council Member Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I would like to take from Katie Witt's ward, precincts number 626, 639, 638, and 629. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, I've never understood why 623 is in Ward 2. It should have always been in Ward 1. We're going to be looking at all different uh, layouts between I'm Ward just, 2 that's and Ward 3. my opinion. I thought I'd give it to you now. I'm not sure if I want to fight for those yet. <laughs> we'll bring the options back to council. and You can <laughs> fight over them at that time. Well, uh, uh, Council Member Levison? You're going to come up with three options. What happens if there's a group that the League of Women Voters decides that they want to submit a fourth option? What's the process for a, a group like the League of Women Voters if they want to suggest a, a fourth option? How would that get into the, the public um, uh, review process? Well, Mayor Coombs and members of council, um, that's part of, that's the reason we're having the public review process because I can come up with three options. Doesn't mean I've got the best option in those three. So as we take the input from the surveys and from the public in, uh, involvement process, we will include any additional options that come up for your consideration that, that meet this, the requirements that we have of uh, balancing those registered voters. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Uh, and we will move so forward. Thank, thank you. you. Are there any comments from uh, council members? Council member Samori. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. <clears throat> Coffee with council is this Saturday. Uh, Katie and I were supposed to be there at our center. I'm going to be out of state, and so is Katie. Different states, I'll say. <laughs> I know where I'm going. And we need a couple of substitute volunteers. So uh, Mayor and Councilmember uh, Levis and I are going to see if you guys would be willing to trade with us where you can do it this month and we can do it 
at your time frame next month. Sure, I'm fine with it. Yeah, that's trade. I'd be I'd be willing to help trade, and because everybody's been nice when I needed a trade, so that would be that's fine. So nine o'clock at the um, the hour center on Saturday morning. <laughs> Ten o'clock, I'll be there an hour too late. Right? Okay, thanks. Um, no, I'd be be happy to to swap with you. Thank you, Council Member Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coons. I would like to talk about my business of the week. I had an excellent opportunity to visit one of my favorite spots on Mother's Day for brunch, Martini Bistro at 543 Terry Street. Uh, it was an excellent Mother's Day brunch. They always do a great job uh, for any kind of celebration. I've celebrated many events there and would recommend you do the same. They're friendly, they have delicious food, and their patio, now that the weather's nice, is going to be fabulous. So I would encourage everyone to try Martini Bistro. Councilmember Levison. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to um, give Council an update on the results from the Colorado Municipal League Policy Committee meeting on um, Friday, which we held by um, telephone. Um, I want to first of all congratulate the, the Council because the um, proposal that we had two years ago to add a um, policy statement on education, a general one, um, has now been accepted to be voted on at the annual meeting um, this coming June. And um, we had a, a committee, and I, in a few weeks ago, I read you the um, the proposed verbiage the committee had come up with, and there were just a couple of small changes to what I had read to you, and um, it was adopted with um, unanimously, with uh, pretty much no negative comment. So um, I, I think it's uh, great that the, the city of Longmont was able to come up with um, an idea that was accepted so broadly in the state. The other item that was accepted to be voted on in June was a proposal for some word changing under the transportation policy area that had come from uh, the city of Boulder. And I imagine um, we'll be getting the information on those um, suggested amendments to the policy statement um, prior to the uh, June um, annual meeting. So I just want to report on, um, on those two things and, and again congratulations for um, Longmont being able to, to get something that's uh, important statewide. Council Member Witt. Thank you. I just want to let folks know to be and I, I'm sorry I didn't have time to look at the our packet for next week as of yet but um, do be looking for uh, information from Airport Advisory Board. One of our board members, Don Dulcey, did spend some time uh, quantifying um, business flights in, that uh, come into the, the airport there. And it's about 15% of uh, all the flights that happen are, have to do with business. And, and so uh, have a look at that and there, Lots of work went into that. It's a lot of brain damage. So it, it, it just want to thank uh, Don Dulcey once again for taking the time to do that. I think he had a little bit of help from some other board members, but uh, he carried uh, the, the lion's share on that. And I uh, did want to say thank you, Mayor and Council Member Lewison for covering um, this weekend. Well, I'd like to weigh in on two things. So one, I'd like to thank our previous council that uh, had the vision to uh, have radon meters you can now check out at the library, which is pretty cool. Um, also, I'd like to do a shout out to St. Rain uh, School District. You know, they're going to graduate 1,800 kids and they had a nice article in the paper. I'm just going to read a portion of it. The strong evidence of teacher Excellence is seen in the rising number of St. Rain students joining the ranks of National Merit Scholars, United States President Scholars, and Betcher Scholars, as well as all state awards in band, choir, forensics, and state titles in individual and team sports. We have reason to be 
Exceptionally proud of all of our students and staff, our district has numerous schools that have received state and national awards and recognitions, including the John Irvin School of Excellence Award, Governor's Distinguished Improvement School Award, Colorado Trailblazer School to Watch Award, schools listed in Newsweek's top 5% of high schools in the nation, schools qualifying for Odyssey of the Mind World Championships, multiple schools receiving top honors in the state of math, engineering, and science achievements. So I, I have to just commend uh, our school district and our teachers. We have an excellent um, school district here that we all should be very proud of. So, city manager, any comments? No comments, Mayor Council. City attorney, any comments? No comments, Mayor. We are adjourned. <laughs>